host, Melissa McHugh McGrath, still recording from the tiniest podcast studio in Boston. Today on The Wilderbeast, we are going to talk about a four pound dog who was the hero of World War II, a boy who solved the puzzle of the missing lemur, and a National Weather Service announcement about falling frozen iguanas. Ready? Let's go. everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in again today to Bewilder Beasts. I'm a little surprised because this is just really exciting. I just honestly thought that this was going to be me talking in a closet in my apartment, my tiny, tiny apartment during the pandemic. And maybe my daughter and four of her friends and maybe a couple of mine would listen to this. And after a friend of mine had posted on her blog about this, thanks, Trisha. And honestly, she had encouraged me to do this whole thing, and a couple of other friends had told me to do this too. It, I really didn't think that this would hit a nerve, and it clearly has with the number of people that have started listening. So if you are new to this, you might not hear this for a few weeks because I do record about three or four weeks out. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for trusting me with your ears and your curiosity. And if you do like this, as I say at the end of every episode, as every podcaster does, but it really would mean a lot if you could tell a friend about this and introduce them to these really interesting and fascinating animals that we've been talking about for now the last 12 weeks, including today. Um, I think episode eight is going out or had just gone out while I'm recording this. This is week 12 that I'm recording right now. It is October 23rd. We have not yet had our election, um, but by the time you hear this, we will have had it. And I'm guessing regardless of the outcome of that election, it's going to be, we're going to need distractions still, regardless of the outcome. I do know that the um, the gravity of what's going on in the world is heavy, and I know that it is important to kind of have a distraction. This episode has no tether to any of those things that are going on politically. Some of these episodes do, like the episode on politics, the political animals that I did in week nine, but this does not. This is complete escapism, and I just wanted to say thank you for trusting me with your ears and tell a friend if this brought you joy or sparked curiosity, or if it didn't for you, but you know a friend who this might actually be up their alley or a kid in your life who's curious about animals or a family that just loves listening to podcasts together. You know, in my case, all of my favorite podcasts have F-bombs that are not bleeped out, so I cannot listen to them with my kid. And my kid likes podcasts that I might not really enjoy, even though they are very much science-based and very interesting. They're made specifically for kids. And I want this to be kind of a, a bridge so that way kids and adults can listen to this alike and everyone gets something out of it. So if you are one of those people, please tell a friend. So without further ado, we are going to talk about a really cool little terrier who saved a lot of people in World War II. But first... So kids say the darndest things. And as a mom, I frequently hear and say things that I never, before having children, would have ever imagined. So for starters, here's here's a real conversation that has happened in my house in my lifetime since having a child. I had said to my daughter, don't put your fingers in the dog's nose. It's not nice. How would you feel if he put his paw up your nose? Don't ever do that again. Five seconds later, no, no, wash your hands before you put your fingers up your nose. You just had them up the dog's nose. I mean, wait, no, don't put your fingers up anyone's nose, yours either. D it, you know, just go wash your hands. <laughs> there was a time several years ago also that my daughter, who was in preschool at the time, had pointed out that the characters on a PBS kids show were making love. And when I was realizing I couldn't possibly be understanding what she meant, I ran in to see and my preschooler was pointing at the screen saying, look, mama, they made love. And there was a little kid on the screen, a cartoon kid, hugging a kitten. And there was this tiny little heart 
floating over their heads. They literally made love. Friendship is lovely, isn't it? So is parenthood. So when five-year-old James Trin said, that's a lemur, that's a lemur, at his daycare, the staff likely thought, sure, kid. Or more likely, while well, he's probably confused with raccoons, followed immediately by, oh no, is there a rabid creature on the playground? Either way, when kids say there's a lemur in San Francisco, there's no way most adults would just think, of course there's a lemur. But little James Trin was correct. There was a lemur. This is not a native animal to coastal California. They instead live on the island of Madagascar. Lemurs, Latin for ghost spirits, are only found off of Africa's east coast. This lemur was a long way from home, about halfway across the world if we're going to get specific. So after James Trin pointed out the lemur, and the daycare director finally realized that little James was right, and after they called for help, the lemur left the school playground and found shelter in a little playhouse. At this point, zoo officials and animal control were called. So when the parents came to pick up their children, they heard about the lemur. And the teachers had to tell them, actually, your kids are not making this up. Kids, teachers, parents, and I'm sure everyone on the block who was social distancing from their apartments were watching as caretakers arrive and got the lemur, his name is Maki, into a little crate to go home. But home wasn't Madagascar. Home was the San Francisco Zoo, several miles away, which by all accounts was rather easy as far as lemur capture is concerned, since Maki has arthritis and is one of the older lemurs at the zoo at 21 years of age, and he also needs special medical attention. It turns out lemurs can live up to 30 years. But this is not the end of the story. Not only did little James Trin find a lemur, but he helped solve a kidnapping. Lemur napping? Either way. So earlier, before James Trin blurted out, there's a lemur, there's a lemur, a notice had gone out to tell residents of the area that a lemur was missing from the zoo. It might have escaped or maybe it was stolen. Additionally, seemingly unrelated at the time, police had also captured Corey McGilloway on charges of stealing a truck and shoplifting. But on McGilloway's phone happened to be photos of a lemur, one that looks surprisingly like the missing lemur from the San Francisco Zoo. Collecting evidence, tying it to the missing lemur, now considered a theft, and James finding Maki all in relatively rapid succession, they were able to also charge Corey McGilloway with burglary, grand theft of an animal, vandalism, and looting. And that's on top of breaking into the zoo and lemur napping the probably napping lemur. So why would Corey McGilloway steal a lemur? Why would anyone break into a zoo and steal a lemur? Well, I suspect he had a bad idea, probably after a night of imbibing on other bad ideas, of breaking into the zoo and stealing a lemur to sell it for money. Or to keep it. But it's suggested that Maki escaped Corey McGilloway at some point, found a safe place in the church daycare where James Trin and his friends found him hiding out. One sad note on lemurs. Lemurs are considered the most endangered mammal in the world, with the likelihood of 90% of lemur species going extinct in the next 20 to 25 years due to climate change, deforestation, and illegal trade. Like the possibility of Corey McGilloway stealing the lemur for money in his series of increasingly poor decisions. And the poverty-stricken area that they live, Madagascar, is the only place that lemurs are found naturally. Zoos can help spread the word and help these animals with breeding programs and other resources, but it might not be enough to keep these magical little animals safe. But thanks to the eagle-eyed five-year-old, this one lemur just got to go home and be safe. And as a reward... Little James Trin, the hero helper who first spotted Maki and ensured that he could get safely back home, has earned a lifetime membership to the San Francisco Zoo. Good job, James. Smokey was found as an adult in an abandoned foxhole in World War II. When she was picked up, which wasn't hard because she was only four pounds, she was sold to Corporal Bill Wynn for two Australian pounds. I looked. This is only $6 in American money today. That's like three tooth fairy visits. 
It was enough to get the seller back to his poker game and not have to worry about feeding this little dog anymore. Smokey, who had the head the size of a baseball, lived in Wynne's tent. She shared his food rations, which they didn't have much to begin with. And unlike the other hero war dogs of World Wars, Smokey was not afforded veterinary care. She instead flew in a backpack dangling next to machine guns for hours on end on flights, including 12 missions. Smokey survived a typhoon in Japan and survived 150 air raid attacks, bombing from planes. She would hear the whistling of the bombs coming before the men could so she could alert and bark and would save the men on several occasions. She even parachuted out of planes with her own little parachute that was made just for her. To earn her keep, Smokey learned and performed tricks for the soldiers, giving them a bright spot in their day. And these weren't your basic sit down and roll over tricks. Oh no. Smokey learned how to walk on a homemade tightrope. She could also spell her name as Bill would call out letters. They were cut out letters and she would just go pick up the right one and fetch it back to him, spelling her name. And she would also ride a handmade scooter, which it would have to be handmade. She was only seven inches tall, so no child's scooter could be modified to work for her. And it was these tricks that helped her single-doggedly complete a communication network at a new military airbase. The United States Communication Department needed to get a telegraph wire through a 70-foot pipe so messages could get inside the newly constructed airbase. But the pipe was too small for the men to fit through, and they couldn't thread a wire through either. And because the pipe was so weak at the joints, dirt filtered through, filling the pipe in some spots to only four inches of space in much of the pipe. So Bill Wynn tied a string and the wire to Smokey's collar and sent her into the pipe. Here's a quote. By now the dust was rising from the shuffle of her paws as she crawled through the dirt and mold, and I could no longer see her. I called and I pleaded, not knowing for certain whether she was coming or not, and at last, about twenty feet away, I saw two little amber eyes and heard a faint whimpering sound. At fifteen feet away, she broke into a run. We were so happy at Smokey's success that we petted her and praised her for a full five minutes. Without Smokey's efforts, communication would not be able to reach the base, as this is before cell phones, internet, and any of today's communication. She was able to save the base. Smokey did the work in four minutes. What would have taken 250 men to dig up in three days, which would have absolutely put all of those men and equipment at risk of being seen and bombed by the enemy. So after the war, she appeared over 40 times on TV and never repeated a trick. She was a smart cookie, and she went on to veterans' hospitals to visit soldiers injured for wartime to cheer them up, making her the first documented therapy dog. But she wasn't the only one. Dogs were being observed all over the world helping humans feel better when the dogs were around. For example, in New York, one hospital staff noticed dogs were helping the patient's morale so much, they ended up building kennels on site at the hospital for dogs to live. Over 700 dogs were donated by 1947 to hospital programs from civilians, including dogs flown from overseas. This was all to help the post-war effort to heal these men. And part of what caused this sudden burst of dogs helping people was Smokey. Shortly after Wynne had acquired her, she was given special dispensation to sleep with the wounded Wynne for five nights in a hospital stay during the war when he caught dengue fever. Bill Wynne's friends brought his little dog to visit him in the hospital, and the nurses were won over by her story. Then they would take Smokey from Bill's bed on their rounds and have her visit all the patients of the hospital. Smokey would come back and sleep with him during the night and then go back to visit wounded soldiers with the nurses during the day. But after the war, Smokey served as a therapy dog for soldiers for 12 more years. The soldiers would forget their wounds and their sorrow, their anxiety, their everything bad in the world around them as this little terrier would chase butterflies with wingspans bigger than this teeny tiny dog. 
Smokey died at age 14, and there is a massive monument at the Cleveland Metro Parks over her final resting space, a larger-than-life monument for the tiny but mighty hero dog, According to National Geographic, as Bill Wynn remembers it, for the wounded soldiers, Smokey was a complete diversion, something to pull them away from what ailed them, something they could await with happy anticipation. In his mind, her ability to make a difference was really quite simple. She was just an instrument of love. And for all of us who have a pet in our homes, maybe even at our feet right now or on the couch next to us, or, as is often the case with my cat, perched right on my bladder. I think we can all relate. Animals do have a way of playing a song with our hearts because they really are just instruments of love. I have never gotten a message from the National Weather Service indicating that I am at risk of falling iguanas. But then again, I don't live in Florida. Iguanas are cold-blooded, They are not adapted to cold weather, and when the temperature drops to a certain degree, they start to conserve body heat. Their limbs start to go stiff, their tail goes stiff, their head goes stiff, and eventually, they lose their grip. And if you're an iguana in a tree, you lose your grip and then lose your fight with gravity. Iguanas can survive short periods frozen like this, focusing all of their energy, again, on breathing and heart rate. And if you're picturing little reptiles, like maybe a tiny gecko or something you've seen at Petco or PetSmart, falling from trees, you are imagining it wrong. (laughs) These animals can be up to five feet long. That is just a couple inches shorter than I am. And I could get seriously hurt if such an animal, dead weight, falling from a tree onto me, a car, a passing dog, anything. This can cause some serious damage. So while we in the Northeast will continue to worry about blizzarding cold and icicles falling from buildings, y'all just keep an eye out for the frozen falling iguanas, the most Florida of all winter expectations. So thanks again for joining me today on Bewilderbeasts. If there are topics that you would be interested in hearing about on the podcast, know of any historical animals who changed the world, animals who help humans, or wacky animals in the news, and also if you have ever seen Smokey's Memorial, take a picture, send it in, bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com. Tweet at Bewildered Pod, Bewilderbeast Pod on Facebook, and Bewilderbeast on Instagram. I'm Melissa McHugh McGrath, author of Considerations for the City Dog and co training director of the New England Dog Training Club. I'm also with Mutt Stuff Media. Now go get curious. I got today's information from Yakima Herald, sfchronicle.com, Wikipedia on Smokey the Dog, nationalgeographic.com. Mashable.com, Wikipedia.org on lemurs, NBCnews.com, APnews.com, and the BBC. Links, as always, are in the description of today's episode. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Lebowitz, and interstitial music is by MK2. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, review, and share with your curious friends. You know, all the things all those other podcasts tell you to do. Thanks for listening.